liberty in terms of equality. And he's saying here, Americans have a chance now to throw off the shackles of slavery, to throw off all forms of inequality that we possibly can. We're not talking about uh, getting rid of, of economic inequality here, but we are talking about sort of the essential, seeing humans in their essential equality as people who are created with a common bond by their humanity, by virtue of their humanity. This is what Lincoln wants to emphasize here dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Again, let's take a step back from the guns, the smoke, the din of battle, and let's look at this in world historical perspective. And he, he's telling you, look, this has been a world of monarchies. Monarchies from the very beginning. We've had a few exceptions. We had some of the Greeks who had their democracy in Athens. We had republics in Carthage and Rome and in latter days in, in Venice. We had the Italian communes that were these little republics in the late Middle Ages. But for the most part, we have lived in world history in a world of monarchs. We are a republic. In a monarchy, the king is the law. This is Louis XIV said, l'état c'est moi. I am the law. I am the state. L'état c'est moi. No. Here, what is king is the rule of law. It's an idea that's important. We're all equal before the law. We're all equal in our creation, our essential creation. By whoever that creator is, however you define it, I don't go to church, but however you do it, is what Lincoln is saying to Americans, the American community. Now let's tie this up. Let's go back to Barack Obama. Let's go back to presidents who have been inspired by Lincoln. And you see the organic wholeness of here, uh, this speech. The obstacles. If Lincoln could do it, anybody could do it. But there had to be a certain environment in which to rise. Abraham Lincoln in medieval Germany or medieval Italy or early modern Romania would not have become the Abraham Lincoln we know. He was very acutely aware of that fact. This is why Lincoln truly deserves this iconic understanding of how he rose, how he achieved so much why there is hope for any American, because we are dedicated to this proposition that you are equal under the law and before your creator, however you define it, the Jewish tradition or the Christian tradition or any theistic tradition that you define it. We are essentially equal, and this country is going to dedicate itself to that so that your full potential can rise as far as you want it to go. And that's why we celebrate Abraham Lincoln. That's why. He's a man for all seasons. He's a man for the ages, forever in American history. This is not a man whose influence over our lives will fade. Thanks. Well, did I provoke any questions? Quarrels. Take issue with me. Yes. That's a great question on Nancy Hanks, and um, he thought that his mother was actually probably an illegitimate child, whose father would have been a Virginia aristocrat. And he thought that his nobility came not from his father, that he didn't think much of, as I've shown. He thought the inner nobility he had actually came through the Virginia gentry. Uh, maybe somebody knew George Washington, who knows? Uh, but he thought his grandfather was probably, on that side, a very distinguished man. So it's kind of an interesting uh, background. Now, in terms of his sensibilities, we don't know a whole lot about her compared to Sarah Bush Johnson, but she apparently was a very loving mother. I mean, she provided the love to both Abraham Lincoln's sister and to Abraham. And um, he, he grieved when he lost her, no question. But boy, what a... Great stroke of good luck, but Thomas, ne'er do well he was in a lot of ways, had a good sense to marry Sarah Bush Johnson. I'm just interested in the book where you found the information about the beating and about Ann Rutledge. Everything I've read about Ann Rutledge is people kind of 
thought this through, but really haven't found any letters or anything proving it. Well, you do have, though, the, the oral testimony that people later wrote about Joshua Speed, for example. William Herndon heard stories, and he, he uh, wrote about uh, this. I think uh, Michael Burlingame's book, um, and this is supposed to be four volumes, and it was su such a huge project, Johns Hopkins Press was uh, publishing it, and Michael Burlingame and the editors decided to cut it down just to two volumes. Burlingame and other more recent historians, you're absolutely right, they're, we have to be somewhat agnostic about what we can know about the romance between Anne Rutledge and Abraham Lincoln. But the consensus seems to be, when you look at the Depression, the severe bout of Depression, and I hope you'll come back in two weeks because Brian Flanagan will be speaking here two weeks. Is that right, Brian? Uh, yes. I think so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brian has done a great deal of study about this question, and he, he knows Lincoln's Depression uh, very well. And... Um, you know, he'll be able to, I think, answer that question even better than I. Um, but you, you make a good point. But the, the consensus, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the consensus among the best historians more recently, Ron White, Michael Burlingame, is that there was a depression that was probably precipitated by Ann Rutledge's death. I read yeah, exactly. I mean, the historian in me, and certainly the way I train students, is you better document it if you don't want an F. I don't want any flights of fancy here. But you know what? It makes for a good story, doesn't it? Um, if you can't embellish the story of the second telling, why tell the story? Um, yeah, the beatings are something that, um, again, come from neighbors, uh, their testimony. Um, you know, there's a lot of... There's, there's a lot of trouble understanding some of the things about Lincoln uh, when you look at the testimony. For example, this law partner, Willie Herndon, said that sometimes Lincoln and Mary would have, Abraham and Mary would have such terrible fights that he would come to the law office and just put his head in his hands and weep for despair about this terrible marriage. I had a tough, tough time. Now, how many people, and apparently there were some neighbors that said that she did chase him with a knife out of the house. She did throw a rolling pin at him. I mean, apparently it was, she was very volatile and it was a very difficult marriage. Now he would not, let's not just you know, gang up on Mary here, he would not have been an easy man to live with. Not that he was himself a wife beater or a child beater or anything like that, but he probably didn't tend to, and he was gone for long periods of time, three months in the fall, three months in the spring, he was very absent-minded. You know, you'd find him going down, say, Jackson Street in Springfield outside the house, pulling a cart with kids, and the baby would fall out, and Lincoln would have a book and not even know that the baby had fallen out of the cart. You know, you'd go down, and the neighbor would have to say, uh, Abraham, Mr. Lincoln, your child's back there 50 feet. Um, I'm sure he was a very frustrating husband. Uh, Mary, who was very ambitious for him, didn't think that he dressed properly inside the house. You know, he wouldn't have his nice coat on sometimes when guests would come to the door and she would scold him for answering the door, you know, dressed so casually, you don't do that. Um, it, it, was, it was a tough marriage in a lot of ways, but not because he was a perfect saint. He was somewhat neglectful. Did he marry her for love or for love? Uh, I'm going to be very agnostic. I, I don't know. I think it's a combination of both. It's, it's my judgment. I think that he was attracted to her. That there's this one scene early in their courtship. I think it's the first night they meet where he is just spellbound by her. She's 5'2". She's he's 6'4". Um, he would introduce her at parties. He would say, well, here's the long and the short of it. <laughs> she did not laugh. <laughs> um, this first night, I think, that they were courting, there's a scene that's painted where he was just sort of awestruck by her. She was very vivacious. She was a great conversationalist. For a woman at that time, remember, women did not have a lot of options at that time. They could not run for office. So they had to live through their men with politics. 